stop in the lobby, talk to you guys. Any advice you could share with me would be greatly appreciated. So uh, with that being said, would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father God, we are thankful for the opportunity to have Brian and Missy here at Grace Community Church this weekend. We're thankful for the longstanding history of RVA going back to 1906 and just the work they've done in Kenya and being able to educate and disciple uh, missionary kids, Lord, as parents are out in the field doing good work of sharing the good news of the gospel, Lord. And so we pray that you would be with RVA as they uh, go out and uh, as they educate and as they disciple, Lord, and the opportunity that the staff has as they get to interact with these kids, Lord, and as they're able to teach truth to them, Lord, as we continue to want to see your truth passed on to continuing following generations, Lord. We pray that you would with, be with Brian and Missy as they're here stateside, as they are on this furlough, Lord, that you'd be with them, that you would be able to just allow them to enjoy time that they get to be with their children, grandchild, Lord, and be able to maximize those opportunities, Lord. Would you also refresh them, be with them as they're here and being able to enjoy time, um, being able to travel and visit various churches, supporters, Lord, uh, alumni from RVA, Lord, and that you would just really encourage them, Lord. We also pray that you would just uh, bring recovery and healing to Brian from his heart procedure, Lord, that there would be nothing uh, of that, Lord, that he'd be able to continue to recover and, uh, Lord, be able to continue to do his daily routine of life as he goes about, Lord. And, Father, we pray for them as they then look forward to this August of heading back and for another school year, Lord. We pray for a great school year. We pray for the positions that are of a need, Lord. We know that you are faithful, and in the past, Lord, you have filled those needs. And we pray that you would just do the same thing again, Lord, that you'd find the right fits, the right people in the right time, Lord, to be able to come and the opportunity they can to impact young people and to be able to not only teach, Lord, but disciple and have them grow in the Lord. And just what a wonderful opportunity that is. And Lord, we thank you uh, for that. And Lord, we pray as we gather here today at Grace Community Church to worship that you would be with us. Lord, we pray that as Pastor Mike comes, bring your word, that you'd be speaking in and through him, and that our hearts and minds would be open to the truth, Lord, and that we would uh, be able to take that and just apply that to our lives, Lord, to be the people that you've called us to be. And so we pray this all in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I guess when I think about it, we were the parents of a girl's dormitory growing up, so maybe we could go to RBA and get a boy's dormitory and figure out what it's like to have boys in a house as well. That's something that we're just learning now with our grandchildren, and it's been a lot of fun, a lot of fun. I want to ask you a question today. Are you a sinner? Are you a sinner? Now, I know... I know that that's a deeply personal and maybe even starkly unexpected way to begin a sermon, but I thought you should know where we're going this weekend. I thought I may as well just tell you up front that this is a sermon on sin. And a sermon on sin begs the question, what in the world is sin? So by way of definition, let me help us understand what sin is. First of all, in the New City Catechism, excellent description. Sin is rejecting or ignoring God in the world that he created, rebelling against him by living without reference to him, not being or doing what he requires in his law. Secondly, let's go to the Hebrew language, the Old Testament. One of the words that's used for sin, one of the most frequent words for sin in the Old Testament is hate. Hate. That's uh, a word that means missing the goal. The goal, what is that? It is obedience to God. From the time of Adam and Eve until today, the goal in our lives is to be obedient to God. And so when we sin, we fail to meet the goal of obedience to God, hate. How about harmatia? Harmatia is the common word for sin in the Greek New Testament, and it literally means missing the mark. So when you think about this, think of a target with a bullseye, and that bullseye is faithful obedience to the will and the ways of God. When we miss the bullseye of, of obedience to God, then we sin, harmartia. Here's another definition, powerful one. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Read it with me. 
Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And lawlessness happens when we ignore God's law by our own actions or even by neglect. That leads us to this truth in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I don't think ever in my life did I look up the definition of all in the dictionary. But I thought, why not? I'm researching, working on this sermon. You know what all means? Everyone without exception. So then I thought, I wonder what the definition of everyone is. So I looked that up. And the definition of everyone is every person. So here's the truth of God's word. Every person is a sinner. Every one of us. In fact, that's why the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. We are all sinners. Now, you think about that, and you ask the question, how can that be? It's the reality of our human condition, friends. It is that way because every one of us are born with a sinful nature. We call that theologically original sin. It, sin isn't something that you learn along the way. It isn't something you pick up at the age of six or maybe five when you start school. It's not something you pick up in your neighborhood. It's not something that someone teaches you, although it can be taught. Not a good thing to teach, but it can be taught. Where does sin begin? It begins in our sinful nature. Every one of us, by our conception forward, have a sinful nature. And then we begin to act out that sin in our lives. At the risk of using this illustration too often, the bottom line is no one ever teaches our children how to throw a temper tantrum. Where in the world do they learn that? No one ever teaches our children how to misinterpret the word no. Right? No means but in some places it means yes. I mean, it's unbelievable. No one ever teaches your child to run away from you when you are talking to them and correcting them. Now, many of you know that I was an only child. And in fact, um, I really am appreciative to Bobby Canestra who texted me this week and let me know that this past week there was a day called National Only Child Day. I had no idea that there was a day like that. And I made a note so the next year I can let my girls know in case they want to get gifts for me and, you know, honor that day, National Only. I might text them today and just let them know they missed that and see if I have radio silence on that text. But anyway, my mother kept not just one baby book, but two baby books. She didn't have a lot to do, because she only had me. She recorded every painful detail of my upbringing, including when I misbehaved. Now, on those two occasions that she recorded, <laughs> didn't take up a lot of, that was not nice. I'm hurt. It's good we're talking about sin and how you can ask my forgiveness. But anyway, <laughs> one of the earliest occasions of disobedience involved something called Handy Andy. Back in the day, Handy Andy was a cleanser. It was a Clorox type of cleanser. And she kept it in the cupboard under the sink. And according to the baby book, both of them, this was merited being entered into both baby books, praise the Lord. I don't know if she realized we had four girls, she should have four babies. But anyway, so in it, it says that she had to tell me repeatedly not to go under the sink and pull out the cleansers. But on a particular Thanksgiving day, while she was not in the kitchen, I went under the sink, according to the baby book, brought out the handy Andy and poured it in the freshly made cranberry salad. <laughs> Little added flavor. She did not record how they figured out that it was in the cranberry salad. I wonder how many went to the hospital. But anyway, that was the day that I think I learned that wooden spoons are not only used to stir cranberry salad. Okay? And since we're online, I don't want to go any further with that in case we get in trouble somewhere out there. But anyway, it was a handy little thing in the kitchen, not just for kitchen apparatus. Every one of us are sinners. We have a sinful nature. 
we do things that are disobedient to the Lord, we have an inclination toward disobedience. That's the truth. And yet what's interesting about us is that sometimes we stumble over that truth. Sometimes we have a hard time grasping it, a hard time accepting it. It is so stark and so blunt to ask you, are you a sinner? It is equally blunt for you to say, I am a sinner. And yet John, the beloved apostle, shines light on our human struggle with sin. And that light is shining this morning on 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. If you have your Bibles or your devices open to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, we will, in the course of this sermon, work our way through those verses. In these verses, what John does is he calls out the wrong choices that people make regarding sin, and then he tells us what the right choices are with regard to the sin in our lives. He helps us grapple with our sin and understand the provision that God has made for our sin. And so this morning, as we study these verses, I want you to judge for yourself where you are regarding how you handle sin. And I want you just to even right now, just whisper a quick prayer that the Holy Spirit will speak to you about your life and about your sin and shine his light into your life. Here's what God is teaching us in these verses. When it comes to our sin, we can be less than honest and forthright about our sin. We can sometimes believe a lie, and we can sometimes go to the point where we actually embrace that lie and begin to live it out in our lives. Too often, John writes, we choose to live a lie. Now, before John exposes what that lie is, he makes a very powerful statement in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, about the essential nature of God. I want you to read this verse with me because it is so powerful about who God is. Reading together, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. As you're studying Scripture, and this is true for Old Testament and New Testament, whenever light is used to describe God, it's, it's talking about his perfection and his holiness. He is a perfect and holy God. He is light. Whenever you read about darkness in the Scripture, hold on to your seat, because that is a description of that which is sinful and that which is evil. To say that God is light is to say that he wants us to personally know him. And so as light, he has revealed himself to us. He has shined light on who he is so that we can get to know him. And the way we do that is through his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, John writes in John chapter 1, verse 18 of the gospel, no one has ever seen God, but God, the only son, that's Jesus, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. If you want to know who God is, if you want to understand the nature of God, then you look at Jesus, and you look at Jesus in the Word of God, you study his character, you study his actions, and you soon learn who God is, because God who is light has shined himself, revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. To say, however, that in him, in God, there is no darkness at all, means that God is never unholy. He is never unrighteous. He is never evil. He is never, ever, ever false. God is perfect in all of his ways. He will always be faithful, kind, and good, and gracious because he is a holy God. He is light. That's the truth. Now, here's the lie. The lie comes in verse 6. Read it with me. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. And what does that mean to live by the truth? Well, Jesus tells us what that means in John chapter 3, verse 21. Jesus says, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Plain and simple, our walk should match our talk. 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 
sometimes the reason that we don't want to get too close to God is we really don't want him, now that's ironic, or others, or even ourselves to know the sin that is really resident in us. Can I say to you that God already knows that? Can I say to you that you probably have a good inkling about it too? And so getting close to God can be threatening because we know he is light. And when we get close to him, he begins to shine his light into our lives and we begin to see the things that are not in accord with his will and his ways. We begin to see our sin that we are not living according to God's truth, that we are not obedient to God's will and ways, that we are not willing to come into the light of God so that we can see clearly the sin in our lives. English Bible scholar John Stott's explanation of this is laser focused. This is what Stott writes, relationship with Jesus without morality is an illusion. Just let that sit there for a moment. Relationship with Jesus without morality is an illusion. You cannot have two lives. You cultivate one life here, so that everybody at church, maybe everybody in your circle of friends and family know you as a faithful Christian, and that you intentionally, deliberately cultivate another life with another group of people that is fully sinful, completely disobedient to the Lord. Your walk must match your talk. You cannot live two lives. Relationship with Jesus without morality is an illusion. Sin is always a barrier to fellowship with God for what fellowship can light have with darkness? Now, that's the lie. Here is the truth. Read with me verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another— and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. To walk in the light means to allow God's will to motivate and guide our actions and our decisions in life. It means to live a life of absolute sincerity and earnest desire to please God in all areas of our life, recognizing that none of us are perfect, and yet the desire of our hearts is not to conceal anything that is sinful, and when we do sin, and friends, we are human, we will sin as followers of Jesus. When we do sin, we make no effort to conceal that sin. We bring it right into the light of God, and we confess it, and we ask his forgiveness. That's what it means to walk in the light. To walk in the light means that we have committed our lives to Jesus. We have confessed with our mouth Jesus is Lord, believed in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and we are saved. To walk in the light, look at the verse, look at, at verse 7. To walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. In other words, we love his church, and we want to be with other believers in Christ. It's not just a matter of Jesus and me. It's a matter of Jesus, me, and all of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, it's become fashionable in some circles today to say, I love Jesus, I just don't love his church. I love Jesus, I want to be with Jesus, I really don't want to be with his church. And, and to, to quote Pastor Will and to put it into my own context, if you were to walk up to me and say, I love you, Pastor Mike, but I really don't care for your wife. I love you, Pastor Mike, I want to be with you, I really don't want to spend any time with Jenny, is offensive to me. Imagine saying to Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I just don't love your church. I love you, Jesus, I just don't love your bride. I just don't love the bride for whom you died on the cross. And Jesus says, listen, I know my church has warts. I know my church can be hard at times, but you cannot give up on the church. You need to embrace and love the church and have fellowship with other believers if you're walking in the light. To walk in the light also means that God has forgiven your sin and erase the stain of that sin. Look at the word of God. He purifies us from all sin. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. We all agree, that's true. But sadly, it's that truth that's actually led some people to not only live a lie, but to believe a lie. And that second lie is that they don't sin. They don't sin. They don't sin anymore. Look, if you would, at verse 8. Read it with me. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, now just sit for a moment. Well, you're already sitting, so you're going to be sitting for a long time. So that's, yeah, I'd like to sit too, but anyway, that's okay. Um, think for a moment. If we claim to be without sin, just let that sit in your mind. If we claim to be without, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a sinner. Yeah, I don't sin. Really? Yeah. Haven't sinned for six, seven years. Really? No. That's what that means. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, if that isn't heavy enough for you, go with me to verse 10. And I want you to read verse 10 with me. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. If we claim to be without sin, we make God out to be a liar. Friends, this is the lie of sinlessness. It is a matter, according to God, of self-deception, whereby we convince ourselves that we are not sinners, or we deny that there really is such a thing as sin. Dr. Marianne Meyer Thompson has written an excellent commentary. She's a New Testament scholar, was a New Testament scholar at Fuller Seminary in California, and she wrote a very excellent commentary on um, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in that commentary, she cites a national, or a survey that was done, a Midwestern state survey that was done years ago that interviewed Christians across a lot of denominational lines to understand their belief systems, what they believe about certain things. She found in that survey, and it, the um, article she wrote is called Pick and Choose Christianity. She found in that survey that 98% of Christians believe in personal sin. Now, that's a high number. And when you consider, you know, the, the uh, margin of error, 2 3%, that's pretty good. 98% of all Christians believe in personal sin. She found that 57% believe that everyone is a sinner. 57% everyone is a sinner. She found that 33% believe that they make mistakes, but they themselves never sin. Now, let that sit for a moment. 57% believe that everyone is a sinner. 33% say, I make mistakes, but I don't sin. That 33% believe in personal sin, but they believe that it's the other person who sins, not me. How common is that? I think it's becoming more common in the culture in which we live. There are some who would say preachers should be careful about preaching about sin because people don't want to hear about sin. And the reality is that's probably true. Who wants to hear about sin? But you know what? We need to hear about sin. We need to hear about sin. Every one of us, beginning with me. So where does this lie of sinlessness come from? Well, first of all, there are some Christians who would say, that the moment that you're saved, you are eradicated from sin. Your sin is eradicated. In other words, at the moment of salvation, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus, you, you are literally eradicated of your sinful nature and inclination to disobey. Now, that's not true. It's not in the Bible, and it's not true. Because here's the deal, at the moment that you're saved, 
you are forgiven of your sin. You receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Your sin power is canceled by the Holy Spirit. He becomes resident in your life. But you know what you still are? You're still human. You're still human. And in your humanity, you are still subject to temptation. And guess what? Try as you might, pray as you desire, there will be times when you will fall to that temptation and you will sin. The reality is, as Christians, we still sin. The question then is, are we sensitive to the Holy Spirit who convicts us of our sin, and do we then go to Jesus and ask him to cleanse and forgive us of our sin? Galatians chapter 5 wouldn't even need to be in the Bible if sin was eradicated from us, because Galatians 5 talks about the battle that goes on in every one of us between the sinful nature and the Spirit of God. That happens. Now, here's another lie, and that is rationalizing sin. We love to rationalize sin. And the way in which we rationalize sin is we say this, if it's not illegal, it's not sin. If it's not illegal, it's not sin. Mm. You know, in some circles that might sound right, but what that means then is gossip is fine. Slander and malice, no problem whatsoever equals political campaign. Slander, malice, political campaign. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? But we know that gossip, slander, and malice, though you will not be arrested in Wesleyan Peter Township or any other municipality for them, are sin. Here's the third one. We redefine sin. We grab some new language. I don't sin. I make mistakes. Mistakes aren't sin. They are mistakes. I love how Pastor James Embry White has summarized this redefinition when he writes, we're not just mistakers who need self-help. We are sinners who need a savior. That's the truth of God's word. I want to say something to you today. Very important. Mishandling sin is dangerous business. Mishandling sin is dangerous business. John tells us that in no uncertain terms, especially in verse 10 of 1 John chapter 1. He writes there that when we believe the lie of sinlessness or when we rationalize or re redefine sin, we make God out to be a liar. Friends, that is stark, heavy language. We make God out to be a liar. I want you to follow me with this. God calls disobedience sin, right? He does. Secondly, God says every person sins, right? Yep. God says, I need to send my son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. We then say to God, God, you got this all wrong. And God says to us, are you calling me a liar? Mishandling sin is dangerous business. Because when we believe the lie of sinlessness or when we rationalize or redefine sin, the truth of God is not in us. His word has no place in our lives. And what is that truth? Brings us to the last verse that we'll look at today. It's verse 9. I want you to read this with me. I want you to use your outside voice. Now, those of you who are raising children know exactly what I'm talking about here. And those of you who have raised children, just hearken back to the time when you said, would you please not be so loud in this house? But I'm asking you to be loud right now. Use your outside voice. Let's read it together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is a beautiful verse of Scripture. Beautiful verse of Scripture, because in it, what John does is he gives us two amazing attributes of God. He speaks to the essential nature of God. God is light, but he's not only light, he is also faithful. You know what faithful means? He keeps his promises. He is also just. You know what just means? He always does what's right. So here's the deal. 
Oh my goodness, this is fantastic. Terry, this is truth for you. Willie, this is truth for you. Ken and Esther, Heather and Joe, this is truth for you. Rob and Shelly, listen, this is truth for you. Man, this is powerful truth, Craig and Kim. Here's the truth. Ross and Natalie, here's the truth. That if we will confess our sin, you know what confess is? It's when we agree with God and admit that what we're doing and the way we're living is not pleasing to him. If we will confess our sin and agree with God about our sin, then he will keep his promises and he will do what is right by us and he will forgive us of our sins and he will purify and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The amazing truth here is that every one of us by rights should have to die for our own sin, but not with God. He so loves us that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for us in the cross. It's by the blood of Jesus that we are forgiven of our sin. Amen? Amen. And so when we admit and agree with God that we have a sinful nature and that we are behaving in sinful ways, and when as followers of Jesus, we listen to the Holy Spirit and we confess the sins that we will commit as followers. Listen, there are sins that come out of this mouth. I won't even ask you to raise your hand if you ever committed a sin that came off your tongue. We all have. There are sins that never see the light of day, but they are just as sinful because they are thoughts that no one else may know, but God does. There is sin that is behavior that is displeasing and disobedient to the Lord. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of those sins in our lives, and we agree with God and we confess it, then the Word of God says He is faithful, He is just, and He forgives he cancels the debt of that sin, and he purifies. He washes away the stain. Listen, he takes away every residue of that sin. He cleans out every bit of dirt that it has brought in your life. He takes the guilt, he takes the shame, and he leaves you completely clean. And if there's any residual, it's because you grab some of it thinking that you should have a souvenir to remember just how awful you were. And God says, don't do that. Don't do that. I want to purify you from all unrighteousness. I want to wash you clean. I want to cleanse you so you are whiter than snow. That is an amazing truth. Amen? Amen. Use your outside voice again. Let's read it one more time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let me ask you, are you a sinner? Are you a sinner? It is absolutely, now hear me. This is probably perhaps the most important thing I'll, I'll say today apart from the scriptures. And you may wonder then why didn't we just fast forward to that, but here it is. It is absolutely critical to our physical, emotional, relational, and spiritual health to admit that we are sinners. As long as we deny it, conceal it, refuse to deal with it, it will weigh on us physically, it will affect us emotionally, it will damage us relationally, and it will burden us spiritually in our relationship with God. Now I know that because there's this phenomenal testimony in the Bible of a sinner who chose to confess his sin. So I wanna read it to you, Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Now listen to this. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away. My stomach kept count. And I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me and you took my guilt away. Two things you need to know. Every one of us, 
at some point in our lives need to ask God to save us from sin. That is called salvation. That is called being born again. That is when you confess that you are a sinner, that Jesus is the Savior you need, and you confess your sin to him, and you confess him as Lord, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, and your life is transformed. Every one of us need to make that decision. But every Christian here needs to also regularly ask God to search you for sin. Do not ever think yourself to be above or beyond sin. Every day in your devotional time or quiet time with the Lord, ask him, search my heart, search my mind. What is the sin in my life that I have not confessed? And there are days when you know very well what that sin is. Do not keep a long account of sin in your life. Keep a short account. And as followers of Jesus, confess the sin in your life and experience the freedom that he gives. No, no knock against my mother, but I am grateful that the Lord does not keep a baby book or an adult book from Mike Sigmund that records all my sins. That when I get to heaven by the blood of Jesus, that sin is washed away. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the power of this teaching that you've given us from 1 John. I want to ask you right now for the next two minutes, sitting where, there where you are, if you're willing, in the quietness of your heart, ask God to search your heart, to find any sin that there may be in your life that you may not be aware of and ask him to show it to you because you want to be free of sin today, for this day. Thank you, Jesus, that you've broken the power of canceled sin. Thank you that you've made the way of freedom possible for every one of us. Thank you that you've provided for us the gift of salvation. And thank you that as men and women who are saved, who are Christians, you continue to welcome us into your presence to have conversation with you in which we agree with you that certain thoughts or words or actions that we've committed as your followers are not pleasing to you. They are sin. Thank you that you've established for us a way called walking in the light. And thank you that you will convict us by your spirit when our walk doesn't match our talk. So this morning I pray that as you have shine light on sin in the lives of your people, that those same people will experience freedom that comes when they confess their sin and experience your faithfulness and justice in forgiving their sin and cleansing them from all unrighteousness. Where would our hope be if not in you, Jesus? It's in your strong name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Stand with me. Let's worship him.